Okay, let's, uh, let's get started. Uh, good morning, everyone. This talk is a deployment story, so hopefully this gives you some kind of idea of the kinds of engagement we get involved with at ThoughtWorks. This was a massively complex project overall. I'm just focusing on one aspect of it, which I thought was really cool, and hopefully, yeah, you find it cool as well. So I'm Phil Jenkins. I'm a developer at ThoughtWorks in the UK. I've been writing code for money for 14 years now, um, many years before that as well. My motto of trying anything once has landed me in trouble quite a few times, but it's also landed me here as well, so, you know, it works both ways. And yes, when I'm not writing code, I like to ride my bike. So if anyone wants to geek out about bikes in the break, come grab me, we'll talk about that. So let's set the scene, show of hands, have you ever been to a supermarket? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Everyone has. Um, so our client was one of the largest supermarkets in the UK. I can't say who. They have been around for over 100, around about 100 years. So in that time, they've built up a massive estate, some new stores, some really old stores, all across the country. And they do have an online presence online channels, but 90% of their revenue, their massive revenue, still comes from the brick and mortar shopping grocery stores across the UK. So like most supermarkets in the UK, they're struggling with modernization and competing with purely online retailers. So they had a vision and their vision was to move to enterprise APIs. Why? Well, when you think about it, there's a fair amount of logic involved with buying products at supermarkets. So from really simple things like how much is this cheese to things like multi-buy promotions. So you can get three items for three euros. How much do I take off each item to make sure the total is three euros? And there's different business rules based on how much suppliers have paid into promotions. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So th there's lots of different rules that currently live on the till itself. So on the checkout device um, provided by NCR in this case, their software is used to determine those rules. The client had to replicate these rules online. So you've now got two places where you store the logic. So this idea of moving to central APIs hosted in the cloud means that both online and physical tills can use the same business logic. So we, we can standardize that. And then eventually, any device with a screen and an internet connection could become a till. So you can imagine a tablet or even a customer's phone, which ultimately gives the customer flexibility as well as the client. So here's some um, really high level view of the enterprise APIs that the, the client came up with. I wouldn't call them microservices by any stretch, but they are kind of split by business function, and there were teams at the client for each of these functions. Um, so things like how much do products cost would be the pricing service, who is presenting themselves, identity, and then information about things like loyalty programs and staff discount would go in the, the customer service. So yes, these are hosted in the cloud. And it's worth noting these are business critical services. So if you imagine tills in the store talking to these services in the cloud, these need to function at all times in order to process transactions, handle payments, etc. So where do we come in? That was a recreation of our arrival at the client. So we were placed in the pricing slash quoting team. So this is a team of around 25 developers from all around the country. There was four of us from ThoughtWorks placed within that team. And this is the obligatory tech stack slide. Um, so it was a designed to be a high throughput, high performance web API. So we had a Java 8 uh, web service, which was exposed via Vertex, uh, reactive extension. So designed for asynchronous, low memory footprint request processing. 
Um, and it's something in the order of five to 10,000 requests a second um, that the service was expected to, to handle. Data was housed in Couchbase, um, document database, very quick read speeds, which were, again, for that high throughput, high performance environment. And everything was logged to Splunk. So Splunk was the log aggregation tool of choice at this client. Other log tools are available. So why were we involved at all? Because this seems like a fairly clear vision, sensible vision, a decent set of technology choices. So the initial idea was that these tills in store would just talk over HTTP into the cloud as the customer was at the checkout. So as items were scanned, as the customer paid for the goods, we would send events up to the service and store those events in a kind of event sourcing way in Couchbase. However, what happens if the connection goes down? Well, currently that's fine, but with this, this approach, the customer can no longer check out. And you think how many times you haven't been able to check out at a supermarket, we've just created a new problem, um, and a potentially a really big problem as well. Supermarkets don't run huge cash reserves, so if this goes down for any period of time, the business as a whole is, on, is in jeopardy. So we tried to analyze this network performance at the client, and it turned out network performance is really bad. So the acceptable SLA for uptime was something like 98.4%, so zero nines, which equated to 60 minutes of downtime per store per month. So you can imagine 60 minutes where customers can't check out. This is just not a viable, viable solution at all. Um, some stores had really good internet connections. Some stores had mobile data, 4G connections, and some had consumer level ISPs running out of a single network card with no failover. So the topology of the network was, was such that we determined the only place for business critical services is the till itself, which is probably why the software was on the till in the first place. <laughs> Fear not, we had a plan. So we could still replace that existing software with our API. Um, so why not just put that on the till, switch out the database for an embedded database, and then the software that's on the till doesn't know whether it's online or offline. We can then sync the events that occur in an offline scenario back up to the central service when we come back online, and then eventually the data will be consistent up in the cloud and we can be used for further processing downstream. We de-risked this somewhat by running in parallel with the existing functions of the till, the existing software on the till. So we weren't business critical at this point. So I'm skipping a few scenes here, but um, we decided to share the same code base as the rest of the team that were deploying the central service to the cloud. We made a few changes, um, so we swap, swapped out Couchbase for SQLite. Um, we tried to keep the memory footprint down, more on that later, but generally speaking, we could use the same code and just make changes in configuration to say this is the till version of the, of the API. So our offline scenario now looks like this. Tills are happily calling the API, collecting events, and when we come back online, the events go back up into Couchbase, and then further downstream for extra processing by finance, et cetera. Okay, we're, we're coming towards a, a workable solution here. So how many devices do we need to install this API on? Oh, 40,000. I hope you're nervous at this prospect. I certainly was at the time. Um, so we had 40,000 mini versions of the API that we needed to deploy. And if you think that one of the benefits of switching to a cloud-based solution was you can make rapid changes. You can deploy really easily. 
really frequently, we would need to keep up with the central service, but times 40,000. Which is where I come on to the rule of tills. So for any, any number greater than one, 40,000 times that number is a really big number. So let's give you an example of that. As I said before, every, all the um, tills actually had Splunk forwarders on them. Um, so we thought, great, let's log everything. Let's collect all, all the logs. Uh, so that was 15 megs of logs per till per day. Um, so let's apply the rule of tills. Oh, and that's 600 gigs of logs per day. If anyone's paid for Splunk, you'll know that's a significant amount of money uh, that we're burning through there. So we had to bear that in mind at all times. That coefficient of 40,000 quickly makes things either really expensive or really, really dangerous. Um, more of that later as well. OK, so I've been using the word tills a lot. What do I actually mean when I say till? So there's, at the client, there's a number of different devices that you scan products and pay for them. So here in the top left, we've got the pickers, so online orders are picked out in store and put through different devices to these man checkouts, like the traditional checkout in the supermarket. Um, we also have the infamous self-service checkouts, where apparently you don't need any members of staff to, to check out, but we've yet to see that working in practice. And um, there's also things like fulfillment centers, so big warehouses, they had different checkouts in and petrol stations as well. So a collection of different devices. They did all have one thing in common, um, and they all ran a flavor of Windows. So when it comes to things like deployment, we had to target the lowest common denominator. So like, what's the, what's the lowest, what's the oldest thing that we need to hit? Uh, it was Windows Embedded POS Ready 2009, which already sounds quite old, isn't it? But, uh, so, <laughs> Um, you scratch the surface of that, uh, and it's actually Windows XP um, under the hood. It genuinely is. It's Windows XP minus Media Center. Uh, someone described it to me as. Okay, so that's really restricting our choices somewhat. The web API was written in Java 8, which just about runs on Windows XP, so we, we're just about okay there. I think the main problem was RAM. So some of those self-service checkouts only had 512 megabytes of RAM and already had built up a number of different tools over the years. We were going to put a Java, another JVM on there. So we had very little headroom to play with. OK, so now we've got an idea of where we need to deploy our software and what's the env what the environment's like when we actually get there. Let's get into the, the meat of this. Let's get into how, what tools are available to us to deploy. So we did some analysis at the, at the client. They have a notion of a, a till build, which is literally an engineer driving around in a van with a USB stick, installing the OS and some core applications. As you can imagine, that's quite a slow release cycle. Um, you can't put that in the Jenkins pipeline. It wasn't really sufficient for, for what we needed. We needed to be deploying rapidly, so once every week, at minimum. There's also some enterprise software management tools, so things like CADSM, Nolio, you may have used these. There was no real standard way of doing this, though, at this client, so certain parts of the estate use Nolio, certain parts use DSM. It's quite, he quite heavyweight tools, and there's licensing to think about as well. So we decided against that. And then we were pointed towards Spider. Spider had quite a lot of things going for it on, on paper. Um, so it was written by the team that was responsible for deploying software to Tills at the client. Um, they used a number of processes, and they'd come to this conclusion that, oh, let's write our own tool. It was already running in the Till estate. So it had been used to deploy things previously. And it came with some funky features like peer-to-peer -peer distribution in store. So you could send an artifact down once, and then the tills would magically communicate amongst themselves and install the software. So the idea was, 
we had a central spider service which would push down our artifact to a, an agent running on the till. And then the peer-to-peer -peer magic would take over and our package ends up on all the tills in a particular store. Sounds great. The end. It was really easy. We deployed all the tills. Brilliant. Of course, it didn't really go like that. It never does, does it? So the, once again, in the world of software development, the reality didn't match up to the, the promise. Let's go into why that, why, why, why was it so bad? So the whole idea was developers would set up a deployment. We'd say what version of the application should go to which stores and which tills. So there's already an, a requirement there. We need to know where we want to deploy. We also had a problem that it was an imperative thing. So it was driven via a UI. You'd set your deployment up, hit go, and then go home. And then you'd come back in the morning to see what the results were. So this whole idea of, oh yeah, peer-to-peer -peer distribution, it's all going to work really well. In reality, this was usually the case. So if tills were unavailable, they wouldn't get the package. They'd never get the package. And tills could be unavailable for loads of reasons. So it may just be switched off. It may be having network problems. It may be in the bin. And the, this problem meant that our success rate ranged from, well, I think our best result was 80% of the tills. Our worst result was 0% of the till, um, which is at least was a safe deployment. We didn't, we didn't break anything. Um, <laughs> but you can see this, this lack of resiliency was a real problem. And this, knowledge, this needing to know where all the tills were meant that quite often we'd, just, we'd end up hitting a dead end, we'd not actually send it to any tills. Or we'd, even worse, there'd be a till that was a perfectly valid till in a store somewhere, but because it wasn't in Spider's database, and it wasn't on the right spreadsheet, these, these tills, there wasn't a central database of where they all were, which sounds really weird, now I say it again. But the <laughs> there was a combination of spreadsheets and databases that would tell you, but unless Spider knew about those, they would never get the package, and they'd continue trading but not be hooked up to our APIs. So every morning we came in and were frequently disappointed. And then to try and visualize this, this was a graph of version distribution of our application after a number of attempts to try and hit all the tills. You can see we hit most of the tills, but then there's always this huge long tail of old versions. And I think the worst we had was 25 different versions of the application running across the UK. And you imagine from a support perspective, from an operational perspective, that's just not viable. You can't keep 25 different plates spinning. And deployments happen so frequently that this just gets worse over time. This just continues to grow. More attempts at trying to visualize this for the client involved a path to production exercise. So this is a, a value stream map. It's a bit bright in here, but the idea is from the, the top left, this is where a developer picks up a story. And then at the bottom right, this is where it's released into production. So this whole bottom row was deployment. So each of these are individual steps. These are people involved in the blue. And in the yellow, it's the tools involved. So you can see that over half of the deployment, the half of the development process was deployment. And then further down here, there's arrows to indicate that this cycle continues. One frustrated developer put this spiral of doom post-it on here. So we were really just trying, we were trying to show, this is a bit flippant, but we were trying to show that the de deployment was taking up most of our time. Um, so we, we weren't able to spend the time on developing features or improving our automation, etc. So eventually it was time for a rethink. This went on for a number of months. Deadlines were now approaching, which really helped focus minds at the client, especially. We were given permission to try another way. So let's try and turn this thing on its head and start delivering some value. I've tried to do one picture to sum up what we discovered. So we're saying push wasn't working, but the answer was right in front of us. So let's try and explain that. 
So here's our previous model. The central spider pushes our package down to the agent, and then all the other agents communicate with each other. And we, I think we've proven that doesn't work. That just doesn't work. So let's turn it on its head. Let's imagine a service. Hey, and let's put it in the cloud, because we've already got one of them. And let's have the tills communicate to the service. Like, give me the software. And let's just use HTTP, because it's really easy and well known. It's well understood. It's not some custom push-based peer-to-peer logic. And then that way, if a till is unavailable, it doesn't matter. When it comes back online, it can communicate with the service and get, get what it needs. And if a till comes on the scene, identifies as a till, we can give it a package as well. We don't need to keep a database of where everything is. We'll let the tills communicate that to us. So you can see it's kind of split into two halves. So there's like a central server side and a, a till client side. Uh, so we came up with the following principle. So we're going to say anything complicated, anything that involves loads of RAM or CPU, let's put it in the central service. We only need to deploy to one place. And we've got cloud resources to make use of, which are scalable and kind of cheap compared to ThoughtWorks consultants, anyway. Um, Till client side, um, we remember we've got not very much RAM to play with. We said, let's make it convention-based. So we're deploying an API. Let's let other teams deploy things using this same tool, as long as you can follow a convention. We are going to need to bootstrap it once. We're going to need to put something down there to s initiate this process. We're going to have to use Spider for that. Um, but let's make it self-updating. So let's use that same mechanism to update the till client as well as the API. So then we, we re we've removed that dependency on, on Spider. So here's a sort of brief overview of what it was built with. It's all kind of um, quick and easy to get up and running. We held our application artifacts and a manifest. Um, I will describe that in a bit later. We'll just put that in S3. The application logic was in lambdas, um, exposed that via an API gateway. And then we used Apogee as a, a front to that. So that had useful features like rate limiting. So we could say that only a certain number of tills could download at one time, just to keep the network from being overloaded. The manifest that I mentioned, it's a really simple mapping. We just map an application version to a particular device. We could define it at store level, so an entire store gets a particular version. Or we could say a till that is of a particular type, so like a self-service till, gets this version of the application. So it's a really low complexity way of, of managing tills. So we don't need a, a massive file with every single till in it. We can be quite generic about what we, what we specify. So really brief overview of the protocol. Till goes, hey, I'm a till, I'm in store A, I'm till number two. And I'm currently running version one of the application. Uh, we use the manifest to look up that. So we say, right, store A, well, you need version 1.5. And then we use the magic of HTTP to redirect the client to a zip of our, of our application. Once the installation is completed, the till talks back and says, hey, I'm at version 1.5 now. Um, we look in the manifest. We're up to date. So we just return a. Nothing has changed, 304. And then that continues. So the till will just poll every 15 minutes or so, just to make sure it's up to date. So yeah, we have to remember we're running on Windows XP here. So in terms of the software that we're going to install on this client, we don't want to be going for this massive heavyweight um, application. So we decided, let's go retro. Um, it's not quite that bad. But let's just, let's just use what's on the till. Um, so there was already tools for things like unzipping, checksumming, um, batch scripts. So you know we've got, a, we've got a programming language built into the OS here. Let's use that. So we'll just use batch scripts to orchestrate this, this process. We did need to distribute uh, curl, but it's not a huge download. And it's a really well-known, well-understood tool. So let's just use that to communicate with our, with our service. 
And instead of trying to keep an agent running, making sure it's up all the time, let's just use scheduled tasks to, use to do polling. Again, it's built in, it's well understood, and it kind of just works. Um, the rule of tills comes back at this point. So our package was 40 megabytes. So we had to distribute 1.6 terabytes across the network um, if we wanted to download the full package. And we only had 500 megabits centrally to, to play with, and then six megabits in store. So these store networks were already close to capacity. So that six megabits wasn't really, it was a theoretical six megabits rather than a real six megabits. So we needed some strategies to deal with this. We updated our manifest file to include a concept for scheduling, so deployment windows, where we could make use of off-peak traffic volumes. If a till contacted the service during a peak time, we'd just say, nothing has changed. We wouldn't let the till do any downloads. Quite straightforward, that one. We introduced deltas. So our service was deployed as a fat jar. We just exploded that jar into a lib folder. When a till requested a new version for the first time, we did a diff, we did just a binary diff in the Lambda. It added about 500 milliseconds to the response time. But once we created that diff from one version to another, we could just store that in S3. And the next till that requests that version gets the diff. There was some client logic that needed to change to handle a diff but we could use our self-updating mechanism to send that down to the clients. So we were glad we put that feature in uh, already. The lighting's a bit bright in here. That's a, a nervous Kermit. So did, did it work? Did it work? Um, yes, it did work. So it took us four weeks um, from start to finish to get a version of our application to, uh, to develop the tool and get a version of our application across the country. Um, so what had previously taken months, we could now deploy a new version in a single night. We decided to split that into like a three-night process. So we do like a canary release to a random 10 tills across the country, monitor the results, and then we could ramp up 10,000, 20,000 a night after that. We also included a generation of a manifest file in a Jenkins step for, for the pipeline. So now we can fully automate from commit to deploy across the country in a completely hands-off way, which is really cool. What did we learn? Um, those are really specific things I've learned, but there are some general takeaways, I think, um, that you can use. So we were pointed to the fallacies of distributed computing, um, which L. Peter Deutsch put together. I think all of these were applicable at some point. These three were really the main ones. So the, the network was not reliable. Bandwidth is definitely not infinite. And it, the network was far from homogenous. These are really important things to consider when developing any kind of distributed system. You have to accept you're introducing a complexity and an uncertainty that the network demonstrates. Observability already like, massively important in dis distributed systems. I'd argue that, that it was our only lifeline. This was the only way we knew what was going on on 40,000 devices spread over hundreds of miles. The only way we could figure out what was going on was good logging, good monitoring. This took some time to mature. We started off, like I say, shipping 600 gigs of logs a day. We managed to reduce that down to just what we needed, but it feels like you kind of have to expand first, then contract based on what you learn. And yeah, we ended up producing loads of, loads of useful charts to prove or disprove hypotheses that we'd have about the application running in the estate. I think this was the only realistic way of doing this. And it was massively useful, because it showed us what was really happening, a real reflection of reality. And yeah, finally, so it was back to basics. So we had to swallow our pride. We were talking about, hey, let's do a cool client in Rust or something like that. And we thought, no, you know, we've got, we've got the tools we need. We just have to accept that we need to <laughs> turn back the clock a bit, learn some, learn some Windows batch. You know, it's a, it's a beautiful language. Um, 
the number of things you can do with a for loop, incredible. So yeah, pragmatism. Pragmatism won out in the end. And the real, the real feature was we could now deploy at this almost the same rate as a central service in, in AWS. So it might not be the coolest thing ever, but at least the, the result is really cool. Um, it's just that we don't get many LinkedIn points for, for Windows Batch. <laughs> um, but you know, maybe, maybe that's not such a bad thing. I don't know. Um, I guess one, one thing I'd point to is that this is a, a good example of the, the Unix philosophy, really, in that it does one thing well. Um, it uses well-known modules, so we use curl. And yeah, just the general concept. So the concept of pull versus push, rather than fancy features like, hey, peer-to-peer, -peer, I think that's what, what saw us through in the end. That's it. Thank you very much. Thanks for me.